Hello, Wine World. Welcome to part two of Silicon Valley Bank's 2021 SVB State of the Wine Industry webinar. This is our 20th year of producing this report. Uh, I'm Rob McMillan. I'm going to lead the discussion. I hope you, tune, you turned into part one. Um, this is a follow on to that, uh, to that video cast. Uh, during the second hour, we're going to continue to address some of the findings that we weren't able to get to in the first hour um, and uh, respond to the questions. I, we're not going to get to all of them. There were over 300 questions, uh, so we really appreciate the engagement, but we'll do what we can to get back to you if, uh, if that's at all possible. Uh, but before we get started, I want to reintroduce our panel of wine industry experts, including Amy Hoops, who's president of Wente Family Estates. Uh, Eric McLaughlin, CEO of Metis, Devin Joshua, who's managing director at uh, Maryville Vineyards and in charge of um, uh, direct to consumer sales at that winery. And then uh, Paul Mabry, who's CEO of uh, Pix Wine, formerly known as Emma Tree, and uh, who I fondly refer to as the doctor of digital. Um, so uh, great having um all this panel together again, and um, looking forward to seeing what comes out of this next hour. That first hour went pretty quick, um, and, and we just didn't cover what we what we really needed. And I have to say, uh, you know, as a participant, it's I, I really prefer being on the on this the panel, uh, you know, all next to each other. It makes it a lot easier. So this little Brady Bunch kind of boxes um, <laughs> makes it harder. And, and by the way, it, um, if, you, uh, if you have a hard time with looking at Zoom, there's a little slider that's um, between the presentation deck and the pictures. You can move that around and that'll uh, kind of expand it a little bit. You can see more of the panel. With that, um, let's, let's get to some slides. Um, one of the things that we didn't talk about, and it's an important one, is the, the change in consumer. Heidi, if we could bring up uh, slide 29, please. That'd be great. Cohort share of wine consumption. So this is something that I, I've been talking about for a, a while, um, you know, raised the alarm a few years ago when we weren't having any growth. You can see millennial um, consumption uh, right at 17%. Um, and there's all sorts of data that, that comes out now that um, we used not to have any good information like this. Um, and um, all data has its bias, by the way. So our, my data has its own bias. You, you got to understand it. Um, but the data that are out there are pretty supportive of, of consumption patterns right around this for wine. Um, wine's got an issue with, with young consumer. And I think we're going to get into some of that. Um, but this is this is a year in this slide where and I, I predicted in two, this is one of the ones where even the blind squirrel finds the nut is um, in 2017 I predicted that the uh, the Gen X would overtake boomers as the dominant uh, share of consumers in 2021 and so uh, I may have to pay off some some people in the survey this next year to make sure I actually <laughs> win that uh, win that bet but. Um, you can see that the Gen X is at 35% and boomers at 36% of share. So that, you know, the Gen X consumer, which is a smaller cohort um, is, is coming up to be, um, uh, you know, a larger and more important part of what we do, but we really don't care about them anyways. And they always feel, <laughs> they always feel so Paul and Amy. They're always dissing us. I mean, yeah. the one that you got right, Paul, uh, you know, Paul and I've been waiting for this. Rob, you got it right. Let's take advantage and celebrate for just a moment that we're about to take the lead in 2021. Paul, yeah. you do your part. I'll do my part. Call your friends. I'll drink more. I'll drink more. I've been waiting for this time for five years since you start calling this. So, you know, let us enjoy and savor this one year, please. This and if, one we, year. if we do our jobs right, we'll get more young consumers in, into, into the category. Um, and uh, we'll end your Gen X reign as being uh, superior. <laughs> In short, so Eric and Devin, are, are you millennials? You guys are millennials. No, right? no, I'm, I'm a Gen X. Okay. <laughs> oh, solid Gen X. Oh, yes. <laughs> okay. Savor I'm, I'm glad somebody's holding up the boomer generation. That would be me. Um, uh, Amy, you wanted to talk about slide 31. I think, uh, I think you'd be a good person to start talking about that one. 
Yeah, I think it's really interesting. And in part one, we talked a little bit about the impact of the pandemic and the fact that we saw a narrowing of the psychographics, regardless of the cohort and age group, because of the stay at home order and the way that people were interacting. But I think it is even more important as we foresee the vaccines being more widely available and people starting to move around, you will potentially get an initial spike, as you talked about, Rob, from people having kind of pent up um, celebratory activities that they want to um, engage in. But as that kind of fades away, we need to really look deeper into the consumers and their core values and what they care about. And I think this does an excellent job as a slide of really putting the, the differences in play for the boomers and the millennials. Again, we've skipped over the Gen X. We know that that high point will only be for a brief number of years because it is a smaller cohort overall, and we really need to see the energy of buying power, interest, and engagement in wine move from boomer to the millennials. And this here really points out some of those key areas in which I think all suppliers and distributors and you know retailers and restaurateurs need to understand the ways in which this new um, consumer, as they continue to grow, as we showed on the last slide, I think it was 17% now up to 20%. So they had a nice jump in 2020, but as they continue to grow, how will you differentiate the way that we're engaging with them? Yeah, and and, um, and so looking at some of these specifically, um, when you look at just value, so as a support group, uh, you know, the older generation, the boomer generation anyways, uh, you know, family was your your support group and, and the millennial uh, consumer found that, you know, my generation went to 50% divorce rates uh, in, in, in my time in the saddle. And, uh, you know, the younger consumers, they figured out that, you know, family wasn't as dependable as they thought and they, and they went to friends. Um, and so friends are incredibly important. And, and so how does that relate to the wine business? Well, you know, evangelists, <laughs> when your friend is in a club, and um, and if you and you encourage uh, lateral communication, you know, w between your members, uh, you know, you build uh, fail safe walls because you're, you're not going to leave a club when your socialization, social socialization, it's hard to word to say, um, it, it includes your your best friend. Um, and, you know, you end up, you know, pulling in more. So it's that stickiness that ends up being really critical, important to recognize. Um, and, and friends that are evangelists are, are really important. Choice, choice of food, I'm gonna cover that one, I think last. Um, business, capitalism versus wealth. Diversity is a, is a big one. Um, uh, obviously recently, uh, civil rights movement drove change. That's the way my generation thought about it. And, and today it's, it's pretty clear that social ethnic diversity, that, that drives change. Um, this generation that's coming up is is not like my my generation was predominantly white um, and um, European. So uh, today, what we're I think we're pretty close to having um, uh, white Europeans kind of fall into the uh, below fifty percent category. So a, a much greater much greater level of diversity. And so when we talk about diversity, what are the kind of things that you, you can do? Well, one of, one of them is being you know, transparent in your social values. You've got to talk about it. You can't hide from it. If you don't, somebody's going to out you. So it, it's, it's critical that you take a policy stand on diversity and that you, you look like that too. So um, it, it requires action and it requires action in the way you hire. And it's not just for, not just for looks. If you really want to understand a diverse consumer and a, and a, and a consumer base, you got to hire people that are in that base, uh, and and give them input. Let them let them talk to you about, um, uh, you know, what that what that's like. Um, so transparent your in your social value and, and the way you 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 go about putting people in place. Um, you know, you got to hire somebody for digital. Um, you're going to have. Uh, you know, all sorts of hiring opportunities. And so, you know, thinking through those things and making those kind of social changes, I think are, are pretty important. I think Rob, before we go off of that, another, another piece that I think is really important there is that the wine industry in the 24 years I've been involved in it has really tended to try to stay away from what they call politics anything yeah. political. And I think the difference in the millennial group, you know, kind of the younger cohort of your Gen X is through your millennials and then your Gen Z, they don't feel that what's being discussed and happening now is political. 
it's life, it's reality. And they have a strong opinion and a strong stance about where they are, whether they feel it is just or unjust. And it's about equity and justice. And so I think it's interesting as we have you know, wineries engaging in the digital landscape by completely ignoring what's happening around us as, an, as a world and as a country is, is, does not play well with this consumer. They want to know where you stand. And, and that is part of that transparency that they're looking for. And I think it dovetails into the diversity because you find that there are a lot of organizations that tend to say, well, we're not gonna comment on that even internally at an organization because they don't wanna be political. And I think they need to understand that within the walls of their, of their wineries, their employees themselves, as well as those that they're targeting to engage with online at their tasting rooms or just share their products with, that they actually want to know where people stand. So that transparency isn't just about the diversity on the website, who's on our staff, who's on our board, but even deeper around how are you truly showing up and engaging in, in the humanity of, of the goings on in the world. Yeah, I, I would say if, if you're not addressing this fact, um, there's a threat to you being outed, as I said, and there's, a, there's business reasons and this isn't just about Black Lives Matter. This is about, uh, you know, the the whole, you know, uh, cohort that's out there now. The, the good part of this is uh, we have a consumer that wants your product. And um, and if we don't have, uh, you know, people that are in that community engaged, you're not going to sell. It's just it's just not going to work. So we have we have a lot of work to do in that. But uh, but that's that's where the upside is, I think. Devin, you got a you got a comment? You know, the, the only thing I'll say to that, and I think you know, there's, there's a lot to talk about in that particular discussion. Uh, but what it really comes down to is uh, is respect and how people are treated in the moment. Uh, not to say that all those other statements aren't true. I think I can speak to Napa Valley, which I've spent a lot of time in. Uh, people of color want to know that when they come to a place, uh, they'll be treated like everybody else. And that goes across all platforms, really. But of course, it's, it's most impactful in a, in a person to person one on one uh, experience, which of course, we don't have a lot of right this minute. But when, when we, we reopen and people will be able to visit wine country again, it, uh, you know, saying as a corporation or as a company, you're sort of expressing your beliefs is one thing, but it, it's really about training uh, sort of the first touch people, uh, the folks that are actually giving service on how to uh, interact with, you know, a group of, you know, 20 something uh, age black women that come into your tasting room. Um, how are, are they getting the same treatment? You know, it's a wine train story from what, four or five years ago, right? Um, it, it's, yeah. uh, it's just, Civility 101. Uh, it's not really that complicated. I think. Yeah. So we, it is something we have to do something about. It's, uh, you know, it's one of the elephants in the room, uh, and it is political, and it's and it's messy, and it's hard to talk about. But um, you know, we all have growth that that we have to get to if we want to be in business and we want to be successful. That's something we got to con- uh, we got to conquer. Um, well, I think I think you're, you know. Amy, you're right that you know it's something that's historically been kind of uh, a no-touch um, issue in the wine industry. But we are seeing some wineries really starting to wade in there, um, you know, in terms of on social justice issues, on political issues, and being being overt and being vocal about what their positions are. And you know, I think I don't I don't know where that's all falling out. We're just seeing kind of anecdotal reactions where they're driving both customer loyalty by it, but they're also driving some people away. Um, I mean, I have some friends that are winery owners that have been extremely overt um, on social justice and on political issues. And they're finding, you know, one in particular that I'm thinking of is finding it's kind of a net gain, but they're they're actively losing clients over it. Um, but they're also driving more loyalty amongst some of their others. So yeah. I don't know if some of the others have experience with this or it's a difficult. It. It's a difficult uh, thing to to get through, and it's, like I said, it's going to be messy. And we, but we've we've got to figure it out. I, I had a speech that I was doing earlier this week, and um, and uh, I think most people in the speech were probably more on the liberal side, and uh, and I said, hey, guess what? Half your customers are Republicans, and the other half Democrats. So uh, and 
you know, it's like, well, wait a second, you know, my values don't align with that. Uh, well, if half your customers are something else, they better align with it. <laughs> so, so we have, uh, we have, this is something we've just got to figure out. We, you know, diversity also means uh, alignment coming together, I think, I think as, a, as a country. Devin said it well. I mean, it's about respect. It's about treating others with humanity and respect. Yeah. And it is, and 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 it doesn't matter, you know, what I think you should do or say at home or in your, you know, personal right. life and who's your partner or, you know, what what you think about pro-life or pro-choice. At the end of the day, it's about treating people with respect and meeting yeah. them where they are. I mean, we talked a little bit about that in the in the um, summer session that we had that we had uh, done via Zoom. And, and, and it is, Devin, you're absolutely right. It's about respect. It doesn't have to become political. It's about humanity, treating, treating people with respect, meeting them where they are, and using that as the starting place of the conversation to engage and educate as we all continue forward. Critical, it's a critical topic, but I wanna move on because <laughs> we have so much to talk about. Um, uh, so let's let's move on. You know, back to this slide. Um, on uh, I was going to talk about um, uh, choice in food. Um, uh, just to, to to segue to that, the the boomers idea of choice in food is we would eat things. If you know, we'd say, well, Twinkies they're not bad for you. I mean, they don't have, like arsenic in them. It's not like they're bad for you. So yeah, I'll take a twink, Twinkie and a ho ho and a ding dong and and a hostess pie and, um, you know, and we found out that obesity levels were going way up and okay, maybe there's some things about that aren't so good, you know, but we were kind of rudimentary in the way we thought about, about health. Um, you know, the younger consumer, they're gonna put things in their body that are good for them. So it's, you know, it's the opposite. And, and by the way, I do have some, some more recent data that suggests that the, the older consumer is just as much into health as the younger consumer now. Um, but their spending doesn't necessarily reflect it. Um, so it's a, it's a little bit of a difference uh, of a difference. If we can go though to slide uh, 36, Heidi, is a, uh, this is a, a Nielsen slide um, that um, uh, I think is, is really super interesting. And so when we talk about health and we talk about wine, um, we have a neo-prohibitionist movement that uh, most of us saw, I think, firsthand, uh, maybe a little bit more, uh, a little bit more apparently with um, the USDA dietary guidelines, the, the things that happened this last year there. Um, and, uh, you know, the guy that was running that panel was uh, an epi epidemiologist with a lifelong uh, career that was into binge drinking, you know, uh, underage drinking and regulatory. That's, you know, that was his framework. Um, and so, you know, we got out in the recommendations what you would expect, that, you know, that there's an appointment that had to happen before that, you know, how does that appointment happen? Who, who was involved from the elk beverage side in influencing that choice? Um, we were all late to the party in that. And there's, there's something that has to be done. The, you know, the, the day that we used to have where we would think that moderate consumption, uh, you know, my generation, if you look at all of the data from um, uh, Arthur Klatsky's work and um, uh, which is the J-shaped curve and then um, the Mediterranean diet and before that is French paradox and, you know, multitudes of studies over decades that showed that moderate consumption uh, leaves, leads to uh, uh, healthier life outcomes, um, uh, or, uh, pardon me, uh, better uh, mortality rates, and uh, in, in some cases, um, better cardiac um, outcomes. Um, that has all been lost now. We're not, we're not talking about um, any of that. And, and of course, as um, uh, as permit holders, you can't talk about it. So you've got to have a national marketing organization uh, that, that is able to do that to, to not only just talk about the messaging component of it, but also to direct, um, uh, and coordinate nationwide messaging to talk about, you know, here's, here are the sound bites that we can use and, we, we, and we've got to push back on this. And so you can look at this slide. Um, and so the question is how much effort are you currently making to reduce your overall consumption of alcohol? And, and these are current alcohol consumers, right? So they've already made that choice. And uh, you can see the young consumer um, uh, is, you know, 
uh, making the most effort, a moderate moderate effort, and, and actually uh, in the any effort, 2019 and 2020, 35 to 44, you can see the you know the the growth rate, um, how they're making you know increased effort, and 45 to 54. Uh, my Gen X fans, <laughs> um, the, you know, making an increasing effort to um, uh, reduce alcohol consumption. Um, the dad bods, that's what it is. That's why. It's the dad it's bods, the yeah. We're working against that. So, uh, so, you know, this, this is a piece of the discussion that has to, has to come in. Health is a part of it. Um, let's see if we can go to the next slide. Uh, I think it's slide. Uh, yeah. Do you think we're getting healthier as a society in general? I think that's as a function. Slide yeah, slide Rob. 37, Heidi, please. Um, yeah, I, I don't know that we're getting healthier. I think, I think, um, I think we're, yeah, yeah I, yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard for, in a pandemic year. I'm not sure that that counts. Uh, <laughs> uh, probably some of the worst outcomes, health outcomes we've seen. And I mean, we've had more deaths uh, since uh, World War II with all the wars combined the more deaths that have happened. It's just un unbelievable. And by the way, at the end of the report, you know, and, and I hope you guys read it, but I'm making a pitch. I, I want to have a, a national holiday, another Friday holiday uh, to remember the folks that have passed and the first line workers. Um, you know, we have memorials for, uh, you know, Veterans Day, Memorial Day, um, you know, et cetera. And I, this is a time I think we probably could use uh, another another occasion to remember this. And we, we have a lot of work to do, I think, but uh, write your congressman on that. But here's... Um, here is uh, another one. Um, what are the, and I've, I've had this in my slide deck, Danny Brager from Nielsen's had it in his slide deck too. Um, what are the reasons you're consuming less wine compared to a couple of years ago? And again, the, those that are saying that they're drinking less wine, uh, the top, top one is you're uh, opting for a healthier lifestyle. Um, uh, there's some spending things, uh, different types of alcohol. You know, I think spirits are, do, are doing an excellent job of the way they promote wine or pardon me, promote their, their product. Um, but, uh, you know, a lot of this comes, comes down to health. So it, you know, it mirrors that other slide. And so another question is, is, you know, how do we do that? How do we do that in the wine business? We're still talking about long days and cool nights. We're talking about special soils and, and pHs. And we spend all this time writing these words on the back labels. And how many of you guys even read a back label in the wine industry? You know, you, have, you read front labels, um, uh, but the back label with all the stories about, uh, you know, the harvest dates and uh, I, I don't, so we need to get back to pictures, we need to get back to sound bites. And when you look at when you look at the way spirits, spirits are having you know very good growth rates, and, and they're taking market share away from wine. And part of the reason is is because they are using terms that reference health, non-GMO, gluten-free, natural. And by the way, a big a big deal, and I think we're starting to make some forward progress on it is calories. Most people can't tell you how many calories are in a glass of wine. Certainly not the glass that, that you would have in front of you at a, at a restaurant. Um, and and calories are a material part of health. Um, so uh, because the consumers count them. Um, so that's a, that's a, a critical a critical aspect of that. Well, and, we have some. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll so, jump in here real quick. You know, I, I, I think there there are a lot of things that intersect in this uh, in this particular part of the conversation. Uh, you kind of started with neo-prohibitionists, and now we're, the, the graph that we're looking at now is about folks, of course, that are uh, alcohol consumers who are drinking less and why. And I think, first of all, uh, I think it's important for, for us as an industry not to conflate the two things. You know, I, I think, um, not to say that they can't sometimes overlap, but I think the, the neo-prohibitionist movement who's sort of drawing a bright line about alcohol equals death, uh, which is something we have to fight is uh, is a battle and i think looking at this graph here i think it's really interesting uh, people who are actually consuming alcohol but consuming less and why it goes right to your point about a uh, healthier lifestyle you would ask paul you know to chime in about whether or not people are living healthier now than they were you know uh, before and as all things today i think it's you know yes and no right it's it, we see more and more uh, sort of stratification in the society in regards to folks that are consuming alcohol, uh, wanting to be healthier. And then there's another subset that's actually 
drinking more and, and, and perhaps even uh, more unhealthfully so, not looking at the science as well. So uh, I, I think, I think you're, you're right and that we have to do a better job of talking about the health benefits of wine and you know, uh, drawing in calorie content and all that information. Um, but I, I think it's really uh, important for us to just be clear about the fact that you know, it's a lifestyle product and it can be enjoyed in moderation. And that's really the, the tack we want to take going forward. You know, another thing that's interesting about the, the chart that we have up right now, you have to go all the way down to the second to the last bar where it says can't afford to drink as much as a reason for people drinking less. And I think that dovetails into something we might talk about a little later, which is the, the continued pre, uh, premium, premium, <laughs> premiumization. I was gonna put a T in there, premiumization of wine. Um, so, uh, which of course bodes well for, you know, the Napa's and the Sonoma's of the world and uh, uh, everybody trying to take price increases. So uh, something to consider. People I think are drinking less, but also drinking better. I think that's sort of a broad stroke statement. I think you're, Kevin, probably, you're probably looking at slide 11, I think, uh, Devin. Yeah, well, the, yeah, the one that's, oh, yeah. That the before one? we get off that topic, I mean, I, let, let's also not forget yeah. that um, we have the antithesis, the antithesis of that, which is people proclaiming that wine is good for you or has reduced hangovers with the clean wine movement. And then that, that leads itself into breaking the social contract. And Amy and I talk about this a lot. The social contract is very important that we are telling people the right things. And when you see this whole clean wine movement or even accidentally the natural wine movement pretending that it's better for you, there's less hangovers, it metastasizes or it, you, you can process it differently in your liver. That's the wrong way that we want to go as well. Calories, yes. Healthy benefits of wine is, um, uh, you know, as part of the product because it's cleaner or it's processed differently is incorrect way to go in my opinion. Uh, there's been questions about whether <laughs> from a regulatory standpoint, uh, there's going to be additional scrutiny on that, by the we way. So. Um, but if we, if we look back at what it was, you know, what was the single most positively disruptive event in the wine industry for consumption? And it was the 60 minutes, um, you know, story on the French paradox and the Mediterranean diet and wine for a period of time really kind of owned the health benefit of it. But we weren't drawing lines between wine producers and saying, I'm clean, you're not. I'm healthy, you're not. Um, but it yeah. was wine shifted in people's minds uh, and consumers' minds in the country as being a healthier choice than the alternatives. And we've well, just and slowly I, and lost and I, I think, ground on and that. And I think it is, Eric. I mean, I, I, as one of my friends said, we sit on the side of angels here. I mean, compared to beer and spirits, wine, is better, wine is better for you. Agreed, but we haven't, we, we've lost ground in the perception article, in right. the perception of the consumer. So we had this huge leap forward that corresponded with a huge increase in consumption it, it, overnight. It was remarkable. And then we've just simply lost ground to other products, you know? So you see corresponding with the, with the French Paradox article, uh, you know, uh, broadcast, we saw wine taking share from beer and spirits, right? Because it was, a, it was considered healthier. And now we're, we, we've slowly been losing that ground back to spirits. And then we have all these new entrants of these specialty products and seltzers and whatever that are, that are claiming health benefits, rightly or wrongly, or, or not necessarily health benefits, but are, are gaining consumers from wine because they're perceived as being a healthier choice. It's a fine line though. It's a, it's a slippery slope, I have to be honest with you. Well, and, and Amy knows better than anyone. Yeah. yeah, part of it is just the fact of the matter, those other products like seltzers have actual information and are transparent. This is a hundred calories. So people then know what to do with it. Now, those of us in the wine industry, I think you even wrote it in the report, Rob, like how many people know what's the number of average calories in a five ounce pour of Chardonnay? right? Not enough. And so because people don't know it and because consumers don't want to have to dig for information, the um, you know, availability now to put on the calorie count will enable then the consumer to determine, right? I think also some of the growth that we're seeing in some of the specialty drinks, the RTDs, the um, seltzers out there really have to do with the fact that they allow people to, with good conscience, extend their drinking day now that they're working from home. I do think that's a reality. And that's a little bit of a juxtaposition to what we're, the slide we're looking at here as to why people are consuming less. I think people overall, we haven't seen a large growth or a dip, it's kind of static, right? In overall consumption. 
And I think what, what we're seeing is while some people are completely opting out and saying, okay, dry January, or I'm taking the year off for my own health. Other people are filling that gap because they're opening up, you know, at noon, two or three, a seltzer or, you know, an RTD, low calorie, whatever, low alk item, because they're stressed out already because the household now is their workplace, their life place and their only place. So I, I think there's a lot of blurring happening and we're just going to have to continue to be prepared for it as, um, you know, as we come out of, of uh, shelter in place and are able to move more freely um, and really just have a finger on the pulse of, of what's happening from a lifestyle standpoint. And Devin, you said it really well, you know, there's the neo-prohibitionists out there, there's the sober curious, which doesn't mean they're not drinking, they're just trying to figure out a balance of what that looks like and how they can maybe, um, you know, augment their uh, lifestyle engagement, sometimes with alcohol and other times feel included, but without the alcohol impact. So, you know, I think these are all important trends to be aware of as, as the industry moves forward. Well, and I, I, I support what, uh, go ahead, Dev. Oh, I was, I was just gonna jump on what Amy uh, uh, sort of started out with, uh, which was transparency yeah. and uh, being, you know, I always say in the absence of facts, people will make up their own. And uh, if people are, consumers are used to transparency, right? I mean, you're used to knowing at this point as a consumer, everything there is to know about something is sort of out there. And I have this conversation with my wife all the time about what should be on the back of a wine label. And, um, you know, kind of, kind of to your point, Rob, about having a, a, a nationwide marketing uh, organization that helps to sort of sing our song, I think wineries today can actually help themselves by being more transparent. I think, you know, rather than wait for some uh, association to come and help us all, I think uh, if you believe that wine is healthy and you believe that there's nothing to hide, the more that we can do as, an, as individual brands, and some already do it, uh, again, without talking about, you know, we're clean and they're dirty, but just uh, at, at a brand level, explaining how the wine gets in the bottle and what's actually in it. I think that will go a long way. You can actually speak to those people that have those questions and honestly be among the first movers to market, uh, making that kind of a, a value proposition and, and sharing that information. Yeah. Devin, yeah. when we do do it, I think we have to be very smart about it because if you look at the anti-science movement, how it relates to what's in a regular loaf of bread and how they call it ingredients that are actually normal healthy ingredients because they have scientific names associated with them. We have to be very smart and very clever about it because the anti-science movement will, especially the neo-prohibition movement, which really is looking to say, well, they have uh, you know, this ingredient or the sulfites, using that as a small example, this is why it's bad for you when we know this is a natural occurring thing in nature. You know, uh, uh, raisins have more sulfites, oranges have more sulfites than wine, but yet they can elevate that as a, as a negative attack. No, you're 100% right. I think a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. You're actually, uh, doing my side of the argument with my wife, my wife right now about what <laughs> she actually understands. So it is a bit of a, a needle threading uh, predicament. Yeah, we have to be very smart about it. We should do it, but we have to be super smart and be proactive in the education because otherwise it'll be uh, weaponized against our industry in a way that we are not prepared for. And we're seeing it weaponized against industries that don't have an antagonist like neo-prohibitionism. So we need to be super smart. Yeah, very uh, time check, we're about halfway through. Um, uh, this hour and yeah already um, uh, I think I, I, I do want to bring up the slide that uh, Devin wanted to talk about um, and I forget which slide that was now oh, that that yeah yeah you're talking about uh, premiumization I think yeah yeah you can see that nice green sweet spot you know between 20 and 100 bucks a bottle uh, and I again I think that really intersects with a lot of the different uh, uh, things that we're seeing out there in the marketplace right now, people drinking, uh, drinking less, people being healthier. Um, we haven't talked about it on this particular segment here, but uh, e-commerce taking charge, people actually getting their wine through, sh through, uh, through the mail, <laughs> through shipping. It uh, doesn't make a whole lot of sense to, to ship a $6 bottle of wine. Uh, $20, $30, $40, it makes a, makes a whole lot more sense. So uh, I think we're going to see that continue, especially as we see uh, e-commerce uh, continue to grow and strengthen. I agree to 100%. That There's, $20 sweet spot. Go on. Let's, uh, Heidi, let's move to, since we're talking about finances, I, I think we got to talk about the economy a little bit because that, that matters in, in the year ahead. Um, and just an important distinction I want to draw on, on slide 13, if we can start there. Um, 
So just, just as a starting point, I want to draw a distinction between the last recession and this recession. Um, and so this is, this is what happened in the Great Recession. We had, um, that was an asset bubble. And things that were tied to interest rates, um, like houses and, uh, and stock market investments, and that, uh, those things lost value, right? And, uh, and you know, people lost their homes, but, but it, was, it was people that actually had homes and they had assets. So if you didn't have assets, your, you know, your ability to recover from that was actually uh, probably enhanced because uh, you didn't lose anything. But we had just, everybody knows the story. We had, you know, hundreds of thousands of people losing their homes um, and, and, you know, trying to work those through the banking system and, uh, you know, the foreclosures and the, we used to call it jingle mail. And, you know, people would, um, um, you know, put the, the keys in a in an envelope and you know drop it off at the bank. Um, it, it didn't happen to Silicon Valley Bank, by the way. We didn't have that kind of. It wasn't our fault, I promise. <laughs> but I was I used to say that during during the Great Recession. But this is a, this is a very different recession. You know, um, you know, in the last recession, you could go get your hair cut, right? Uh, barbers didn't lose their job, and in most recessions they do. And and this is a service economy, by the way. But what changed, let's go to the next slide, Heidi. What, what changed in, in, in this recession is uh, that the thing that drives it is your proximity and, and able to service your, your customer. So the service sector got hammered. Um, and so when you, but when you look at core retail sales, um, you know, this is what happened. You look at stock market or you know, I, I haven't checked today, but we're, we're trend, you know, been trending at all time highs and people are, are having a hard time understanding, you know, why is this? Look at civilian un unemployment or civilian employment, I should say. Uh, you know, it, it kind of looks the same. A little flattening here lately. We're, we're just really late on fiscal stimulus. Um, and I wish that we'd put a restaurant bill together um, and do something about that. But, um, you know, that's it's not my role, <laughs> um, but it's needed. And so, we're, you know, flat, flattening <laughs> out, I, I don't want to run. <laughs> Um, but you, you can see how quickly compared to that last slide, you know, we've gone through recovery, but you know, the, the ones that have really lost this ones are the ones that it could afford at least it's, you know, it's tasting your own people. It's, uh, it's hotel operators, uh, that are in, uh, you know, cleaning rooms and bartenders and, and, uh, middle managers in, uh, in retail, uh, I mean, it just, it, it's, it's, it's disastrous and, and our, the unemployment rate is still very high. And yet we have this, this disconnect. Some people call it a K-shaped recovery where you have the, the people that afford at least, you know, going down and, you know, in California, we have a, a tremendous problem with the unemployment, uh, getting checks to people because of fraud. It's just a, I mean, it's just a disaster. Um, and, you know, in, in the middle of that, um, we're having all this, you know, stuff happen. And, and um, if we go to the next slide, and, and I mean, when I say stuff, I mean positive stuff. You know, our sales are, are down like 7% on average for the, for the premium wine industry. It's, it's not that much compared to what we thought. This is a I'm grateful to Euro monitor. They gave me, um, uh, their data on, uh, on luxury brands, um, and, um, in Europe and the U S uh, and, uh, here's an example. So you can see what happened with wine in the great recession here on the left side, 2009. Um, you know, I have a similar slide that I, I don't think I'll put it up right now, but it's the, you know, financial statement benchmarks that we have in it. And uh, at that point we had um, uh, sales growth that turned negative for the first time ever. Um, but it, it flipped around very quickly. And we ended up at that, at that great recession point, we had trading down. That was the whole mantra, was, you know, it's trading down. Well, as, as Devin was saying, people are, you know, we've got a kind of a breath of fresh air into premiumizing now. People are out buying uh, more expensive, the better growth rates are in the more expensive wines as you start to move up from $10. And then, you, you know, you get up to the, the COVID period where we are today and, uh, and it drops, you know, the, the drop's been fairly minimal. Um, as I mentioned earlier in the last show, um, we had, uh, I think we're gonna probably come in right around 0% growth. I, I didn't mention this, but uh, 
uh, in still wine, about 0% in still wine. In the report, I think it says, I think it's 1.23% is the chart that I have in there. That was in the November. December was not good. Um, you know, the occasions just weren't good. But the, for, the forecast, the forecast looks, you know, rather, rather positive. I mean, we can, we can get there. Uh, you know, the ec the economics play out if if um, you know the young consumer starts to to get on board. If the economy stabilizes, you know, if 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 we can get through the this period, there there is upside. Um, but the recovery is much quicker than what we experienced last time if we can get fiscal stimulus and if we can get you know to the other side of the hill and uh, on herd immunity amy you wanted to say something yeah i was just going to say i think it's interesting though as we look at this against luxury wine and i think we talked about the um you know the the potential not v-shape but k-shape because there's such a, a differential uh based upon the higher uh, socioeconomic groups and the lower socioeconomic groups and who is impacted and looking here just at us um, luxury wine sales, we are not seeing the underlying cost of those higher end wineries to continue to sell. This is just the accumulation of that. And I think when we look at maybe slide 47 here, that talks about um, your winery's financial strength as self-reported, and then maybe roll in and get some information from Eric on um, interest in acquisitions and what he thinks we're going to see out there, because it is interesting to, to take a look, right? Again, self-reported data here, but we're able to see people saying everything from, you know, this has been a rock solid year to this has been one of, you know, this has been a really tough year for us. And, and I think the, the clouding of the luxury wine growth is coming out of the fact of what we often argue from Nielsen data, which is while you can see growth in over 20, it doesn't show you that bottles that used to sell for 80 are now selling for 40, right? And so the individual impact that that's having on the wineries themselves, not it, it's being um, covered up by the, by the data just showing by price gathering. So I do think you're experiencing as individuals in their own personal lives are experiencing very different um, impacts of the current pandemic and our way out of it. I think wineries are also um, very much um, a 180 from each other, depending on what their stability was going in and, and how they've been able to adjust um, during this pandemic times. Eric, you wanted to talk about, um, I think this slide, 47, as Amy mentioned. Well, I, I think it's important to understand that slide 47 here is is self-reported data. So, and and it's and it's um, perception, right? So, there's not a definition of what is rock solid, what is good, what is strong, etc. Um, but I, I think that there's um, it's really interesting. It's a, a slide because from a self-reporting standpoint, if you combine everything from good to rock solid, we've got 79% of wineries saying that their, their financial strength is good to rock solid. That to me doesn't entirely jive with what my perception is. I mean, I don't have 79% of the people that walk through my door feeling good to rock solid. Um, it might be maybe more 50%. Um, so I don't know if this is just a little bit of projection or people wanting to perceive themselves this way. It's a yeah. It's a it's a good point about self report. By the way, there is a there is a bigger definition on the uh, in the uh, question when we ask it, but uh, but it's it is self reporting. So it, there's a range of error for sure. It, it's you know it's uh, it's like natural. What is natural wine, right? Yeah. It, it means it a bunch of different things to different people. But another way to look at this slide though is um, you can see in rock solid how we've gone from 18 percent down to 11, very strong 21 to 14. So, uh, you know, it's a deterioration in the very strong, right. if you want to think about it that way, uh, you know, the strong ends up being more flattish and then an increase in, in those that are just good uh, uh, or very weak. And, and by the way, Eric, I uh, uh, have to point out that Northern Oregon is the only that self-reported they were dead. I think I've gotten a call from that winery, so. <laughs> <laughs> but I yeah. think Eric, maybe some of it as being self-reported to your point, I mean, Rob makes it that yes, the trend is, is a downward trend saying things aren't as good as they used to be is yeah. what they're admitting here. Self-reportedly at what levels or with what transparency, not really clear. But if we go over to slide 42, interest in selling as self-reported, and then the following slide, we can wait a second, but flip to it next around interest in acquisition. From your perspective, 
you know, some of this could be bolstering people saying, we're not as good as we were, but we're really strong still. And FYI, I'm also reporting on this slide, maybe, yes, and I'm interested in selling, <laughs> right? So yeah. like, how is how are you seeing that in the industry right now? It's a really good question. You know, I often get uh, uh, comments from people who say, oh, well, I bet this is really good for your business. You know, now everybody wants to sell because there's distress in the market. Um, what, we, what we're actually seeing from winery owners is maybe more, more sobering understanding of where they really stand and more realism. I think that there was a lot of, you know, a lot of people have this kind of, their retirement plan is that somebody rich and dumb is going to show up and give them a check. Um, and my professional experience is that the, those, the, the existence of, of those people is significantly overestimated. Um, and so, you know, when deals get done from both the buy side and the sell side, it really just has to make sense. So every once in a while, sure, you get somebody who does something wild, uh, but generally the deals have to make sense and people are paying more attention to their business and are frankly more realistic about, um, about their likelihood of exit. So how, we're not easy, seeing a huge Eric, how change. easy is it, how easy it, is it to sell a dead winery? Um, what at the appropriate price, the assets of a former business can be sold, but there's virtually no interest in buying a dead, a dead business. Yeah. Now, sometimes there are dead businesses that have attractive assets. And when those assets are priced appropriately and can be repurposed into somebody else's business or a new business, those assets can be sold. And I can so say that we certainly in our business uh, are seeing a, a higher, a shift towards more asset sales um, happening in the marketplace where, you know, when a winery comes to me and says, hey, how much is our winery worth? You know, we kind of do a, a, a base analysis of saying, okay, well, here's how much your assets are worth and here is how much your business is worth. And hopefully the value of the business outpaces the value of the underlying assets. And we can talk about, you know, how much goodwill is there, how much, how much real brand value is there. But- yeah. Increasingly, we're seeing wineries where the value of their business based upon those valuation metrics isn't outpacing the value of the underlying assets. Yeah, so, so in those, yeah. my point, my point in, in, in asking that question, it was a leading question, is you, you got to know when to hold them, when to fold them. And, uh, and you, you don't want to wait till you're dead. Uh, that's... Uh, that's not a, not a good solution for success. Uh, and I get this question, by the way, I, it's important for me to say this because, um, you know, there were over a hundred people in the press that signed up for this. Um, uh, the press at times is looking for, uh, you know, stories that, you know, like you say, if it bleeds, it leads. And so I keep getting this question, are you going to see wineries go bankrupt? And my answer is always no, it's not the way it works. Um, there's always somebody else that wants to buy a winery. This isn't like a restaurant. So my favorite restaurant um, in Napa, a uh, little place called El Posto, um, used to be a paint store. And a lot of locals go there, you know, really good food, but it was a paint store. Paint store closed, restaurant moved in. Restaurants fail and they go dark for a while. Um, they may turn into paint stores, but not wineries. Wineries, they when they sell, they sell something. So we're we're not going to see uh, you know fewer wineries. Uh, in fact, I still think we'll probably see a continuation of more wineries. That's just not going to happen. But uh, but you know, with that as context, Eric, offer your point of view toward uh, the M and A market for this next year. Uh, well, I'd agree with what you said about Rob. Uh, there, Rob, is that we don't, we're not going to see fewer wineries. Uh, wineries are really asset based businesses, whereas restaurants are cash flow based businesses. And so there's just too much durable value in the underlying balance sheets there. So they'll get repurposed in some way. But what we are seeing, um, and we've been consulting for a lot of wineries that come to us that we don't believe there are buyers for, but there's there's value in their underlying assets. And we've been advising people, really, your most profitable exit is a wind down. And people just flat refuse to do them. You know, whether it's emotionally or, 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 or how they want to be perceived, people just flat refuse to do wind downs. We are starting to see wind downs happen now. People, that has been a big crossover, but it's not going to be something big in public. It's not going to be a big public blow up of, oh, your favorite winery is closing. They're slowly going to fade away in a quiet way that you're not even going to hardly notice. Um, so, 
I'm sorry, do you, do you think that that phenomenon uh, conflicts with what Rob was saying about the fact that he doesn't feel that there, that there won't be fewer wineries? If, if you're seeing wine downs, which has never really been anything you've seen before? Yeah, no, because I think most of those assets will, you know, if it's a, you know, those wineries and those vineyards will be repurposed into other businesses and there will be new entrants into the market that are going to pick that up. Um, I think we do need fewer wineries, uh, but I don't think that that's going to happen. Um, I think so, but the m a market uh, remains pretty active, and I think the if anything, it's more active than ever. I, it's but it's a game of musical chairs. There are more chairs, and there are more people going around the circle. Um, we're not necessarily seeing a, a bunch more people grabbing chairs. I mean, we did four transactions last year, uh, which for us is about an average year. Um, and I know, uh, but we're expecting. We have a bigger pipeline going into 2021 than we've ever had. So we think 2021, we're going to see a lot of transactions. Um, but there's, um, you know, buyer, buyers feel like the distress in the market should cause uh, a, a, a half price sale or a BOGO or something. You know, they think that, but not all of the assets are going to be discounted um, equally. Right, so the buyers want a deal because they want to be active in a distressed market, and but they want a deal on the on the businesses that aren't in distress. And as we've talked about already, there's a lot of businesses that are doing really well, and those businesses, their value is not decreasing. If anything, their value is increasing because they're showing that they're able to perform in a market where um, where other people aren't. So we're seeing more bifurcation of performance of businesses. So some people are doing fine. A lot of people are doing better and a lot of people are doing worse. So it's back to that kind of K-shaped thing, but writ up to the winery level that we're seeing more divergence of performance and the high performing wineries are, are still what people are interested in. So the two types of transactions that I think are gonna be happening in the, for, in the future here are gonna be discount asset sales, people getting a garage sale on good assets on broken businesses or, uh, and then repurposing them, or people paying good and fair valuation on strong businesses in the marketplace. What's going to be what difficult to deal, make happen is going to be the businesses that are in the middle. And the, one of the things that supports it back to that economic, uh, short economic uh, discussion is there's a lot of cash in the marketplace right now that's driving the stock market higher. And uh, when you have low interest rates and a lot of liquidity as we do right now, you know, that, that begs people looking for asset purchases. Um, so it, it, I know right now in, uh, in California, there are a lot of transactions that are happening quietly with, uh, with big funds, funds F-U-N-D-S, uh, on the vineyard side. Yeah, um, we're seeing the same thing up here. There's so much dry powder in the market. I, I was really jaded on institutional investment in the wine industry because I spent so much time with people, not with institutional investors, educating them on the wine industry to the end of you know, many, many hours of, of education have them go, why would anybody do this? This is dumb. I'm yeah. like, yeah, those investors, they're, they're reaching deeper into the market to find places to deploy the dry capital. Yeah. And so yeah. the wine industry, uh, a lot of institutional funds and a lot of private equity funds that, uh, that have capital that has to get deployed, they just weren't getting down to the wine market. They couldn't make sense of it. They're starting to make sense of it, um, not because the wine industry's financial performance is improving, but because there's just too much money looking for places to invest. Let's um, uh, let's switch. We have uh, about 15 minutes left, um, so let's switch to um, three tier. We've had a, a lot of questions that have come in online um, in the first video cast and, and, um, in the signups that talk about, um, you know, they want to know what's going on with, with three tier. What's, what is our expectation? And, um, I know Paul, I think you talked earlier about some thoughts you might have on it. Well, I, I think that candidly, there's a whole new category in three tier that, uh, you know, most wineries are leaning into pretty hard. They're calling it e-commerce. I think that's falsely, uh, labeled but it's um, uh, essentially uh, digital management of wine.com, Wink, Wine Still Sold Out, uh, uh, Drizzly, Instacart, huge departments. And they're deploying those dollars and that energy against those categories and having huge success. And Amy probably could speak even more to that. She's um, you know, actually had teams that have done that, but um, it's a big transformation um, in the industry. And there's probably about you know, 10 experts at this point, maybe five that are really driving that. Um, but you can see, 
um, using this new methodology of combining digital and three tier to drive increase in sales is pretty magical, um, especially with on-premise booming so much during the pandemic. I, I have an interesting, well, at least I think it's interesting okay. <laughs> point of yeah, view. Yeah. I hope you do yeah. um, about three tier. And um, I look at the beer industry as an example. The beer industry consolidated um, to drive efficiencies over a very long period of time. And eventually they got down to three beer companies kind of. Um, and um, they produced cheap beer, but it wasn't very good. And the the consumer, uh, you know, kind of opted out. I think it was the Craft Beer Act. Of, I think that's what it was called in 86 that got passed that allowed people to make beer at home and uh, uh, in small quantities. And, and, you know, ever since then, craft started to take off because the consumer was looking for better. The wine industry was in a good spot. We, we, would are, we had already started to premiumize because that's what the consumer wanted. And, um, and so, the, you know, the West Coast, the U.S. started to, started to take off. Spirits were probably, you know, next in line and, and, and uh, you know, beer was a little bit behind, I think, I think the curve. But if you look at what's happened in the wine side, um, you know, we've had this wholesale consolidation now for a long time. Um, and, you know, so I think we're kind of down to, was it about two representing half? Um, half of the, the market, something along those lines. And um, it, it's interesting to see what's happening in the background with uh, uh, one of them has made an investment in LibDib. Um, uh, another just announced uh, not too long ago that they had made an investment in a digital marketing group. Um, it's, you know, and I think it was- Not inconsequential, the digital marketing group. They would always had people that would help internally to do that, but this, this uh, it's a really a fully integrated strategy to enhance the engagement of digital and the self-service model for the retailers and the restaurateurs to be able to, in my opinion, to be able to put less feet on the street and get more efficient right. economically in the way that they're presenting wines and then trade the responsibility for promotion of your wines back to the supplier via asking for dollars to promote on their internal digital platforms that now act as the salesperson to those accounts. That's right. Quite yeah. from, a, of a, you know, from a strategy and a, and a way to decrease um, you know, personnel cost and increase efficiency, um, but it does switch the onus and then the, the um, changes the margin structure of what it costs to do business in that, in, in that sector. Well, and also, I was going to say, Paul, the, the large uh, uh, wholesaler, you know, has got a problem because, you know, as we talked, there's still premiumization. People are still going for better and fewer. And yet, just like the old beer setup, it's the, the wholesale is made for efficiencies. It's made for moving volumes. And, uh, and, you know, the great equalizer is the interwebs again, it's the, it's digital. Right. So um, I, I look at this and I say, well, you know, wholesale, they're smart business people. This is a hedge that they, they see what's happening. They see what's happening with, uh, uh, you know, the Lebemoff case uh, just got, uh, uh, it wasn't granted, um, what is it called? Cetery, Satori, anyways, I don't, I'm not a legal. <laughs> Maybe, but it's it wasn't granted um, a hearing at the Supreme Court, so that was a uh, going to be an opportunity to maybe enhance re, uh, retail shipments uh, direct to consumer, and so the you know there there are cracks that are that are continuing to build, and uh, and at some point, you know the they the wholesale I think wholesalers have to either create a solution, uh, or or they they threaten not their existence because uh, I think people overplay that. It's like the, the wholesalers have a, a, a very good product that they deliver. And, uh, but they, they need to, to be able to service that part of the market, the smaller part of the market. And, and it doesn't work when you continue to consolidate and consolidate and consolidate. That's not necessarily a solution for big box stores, not solution for independence and, and a lot of the market. So, uh, there, there are changes that are happening and, and they should accelerate. I mean, that's just the way things work. Rob, this has already happened outside of wine. I mean, like U.S. Foods went 40, I think it's almost 40 percent, um, you know, digital through an e-commerce platform. I think the big question, and Amy probably shares this concern, maybe Devin as well, which is how do you rationalize those margins that wholesalers are taking that are justified by feet on the street when you shift it to digital? 
um, and it doesn't have the same cost infrastructure. That's going to be the real pressure cooker that they're going to have to face going forward. And I think Amy can probably talk much more about that. That would take us another hour at least, and we don't have time okay. for that today. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's it is something that will continue to be discussed is that you know margin compression and where things are. Uh, good segue. Thank you for, for catching that, uh, Amy, um, because we are at the end of part two. Um, so um, as a reminder for, for everybody that's tuned in, uh, you can access the 2021 State of the Wine Industry Report on our website, svb.com. Um, and then on-demand replays of the video cast will be available on our website and uh, shared out to all the attendees and registrants. Uh, so you should be able to see that as well as the replay of this. And with that, uh, I'd like to thank you for tuning in to these two-part series and video cast of the release of the 20th anniversary year of the Silicon Valley Bank State of the Wine Industry Report. Uh, we wish you success in the year ahead, health in the year ahead, and, uh, and we're looking forward to seeing you at Silicon Valley Bank when we can be in a, a point of social nearness. Uh, have a great year and look forward to seeing you.